not immigrant birth. Okay. Uh, whereas there's then there's also a religious worker green card category, which is very similar. The requirements are slightly higher, so I'll, I'll describe the difference. Uh, there are some challenges right now with the green card category. It doesn't mean it's not worth pursuing, but there's some challenges, um, and I'll, I'm going to explain those when I get there. Um, I, I understand that probably in the group here, there's different levels of understanding of U.S. immigration law. So I'm going to try to go slow. If I if I skip something that's if it seems obvious, or if you're afraid like you're going to ask a dumb question, don't worry. Immigration law is really confusing. And sometimes the most basic seeming questions can be the most important. And also, if you're just a seasoned veteran of immigration law, forgive me if I'm going too slow and you just want me to get to the, the key stuff. So just have patience on both sides. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the non-immigrant visa, the one that's valid for up to five years. And then when I get to the green card, I'll describe what the differences are. Uh, for the non-immigrant visa, you have to have a job offer in the United States from a religious organization. And that religious organization has to have a tax exempt letter from the Internal Revenue Service. It, um, usually that takes the form of a 501c3 tax exempt letter, though in certain cases, the religious organization might have a different kind of tax exemption. Uh, that's okay, but it has to be registered as, as some kind of a nonprofit religious organization with the IRS, the, that's the US tax authority. Um, and they're they're fairly strict on that one. Um, you have to have the documents. You know, you they have to have the letter from the IRS. Um, sometimes that's a, that itself can be a bit challenging. It doesn't have to be a, like a church or a mosque or a temple or something like that, though. It could be a religious school. It could be a religious nonprofit, like a some organization that works with youth. Um, it could be uh, whatever other kinds of religious organizations. Uh, you can you can think of uh, people have done them for uh, religious nursing homes. That there can be some challenges with that, um, but it has to be the organization has to be a religious organization, and then you have to be coming to do religious work for that organization. Now, what exactly constitutes religious work can be again a little bit hazy. Certainly, a minister like a a, a pastor. Um, or an imam or a rabbi, you know, like a, the official religious leader of an organization qualifies as religious. And in some cases, they're in a, a special category. But lots of other kinds of religious workers uh, can count. So, for example, uh, you could be a religious school teacher. We just, I'm working today on uh, someone who teaches Hebrew language at a Jewish school, to, um, you know, teaches kids how to speak Hebrew. And that's considered a religious. Uh, position. I could be a youth worker. Um, we've worked with uh, addiction um, treatment specialists if it's a religious addiction treatment center. So it can't be a secular religious treatment center. But if it's if you're doing a sort of addiction treatment with a religious angle at a religious treatment center, just as an example, that's a religious position. Uh, the, the, the key is that you have to have been part of the religious denomination, the religious group of your future, your employer in the U.S. for at least two years prior to applying for the visa. You don't have to have been in the United States for two years. So, for example, um, let's say there's an Assemblies of God, like a Pentecostal church, and you're a member of the Pentecostal church in your home country, and you're going to go work for a Pentecostal church in the United States, you have to have been a member of that church for two years prior to coming. What exactly constitutes the same religious group can depend? So for example, if you're gonna be a pastor, they're probably gonna hold you to a pretty close connection. If you're a Catholic priest in you know, Nigeria, you're gonna be a Catholic priest, you're gonna be working for a Catholic church in the United States. But for example, sometimes like for the addiction treatment center that we've worked with, um, They've, they've accepted Christian, just generally Christian, as the same religious group. If you've been a Christian for two years, then you can work for the, the Christian group in the United States. Um, you don't uh, note that for the non-immigrant visa, that is this, this one that is only valid for up to five years, you don't have to have worked for that religious organization for two years. You only have to have been a part of it. 
but you have to be going to work in the United States paid for at least 20 hours a week. It doesn't have to be full time, but you have to be paid for at least 20 hours a week. But note that you're only authorized to work for that religious organization. So you can't get the R1 non-immigrant visa, have a part-time job at a church, and then get a part-time job somewhere else. You only are authorized to work at the religious organization. And the religious organization has to show that they're able to pay. And the difficulty about that really depends on the size of the organization. So a really small startup church. So for example, we have a lot of immigrant churches here in Minnesota. And if there's like a small, very new church that maybe has 25 members and a small income, it might they might really want you to show quite a bit of paperwork to demonstrate that the person will be able to be paid. But then sometimes you work with a big, giant religious organization that maybe has millions of dollars a year, you still have to show the ability to pay, but in that case, it's going to be easier. So I'm just trying to point out where the, where the difficulties might lie. Um, also, just a note with that non-immigrant religious visa, that's called the R1. Um, the only, the, the person who holds the visa is authorized to work in the United States. So a spouse or children are not authorized to work in the United States. So if a woman comes to, you know, work in a religious school as a teacher, her husband would not be authorized to work somewhere else unless he had his own work authorization. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So that's the religious non-immigrant visa. Now let's talk about the religious worker green card and it's gonna be very similar, but then after I've described the requirements, I'm gonna tell you about some of the challenges um, right now with that category. So to be a religious, to, to qualify for the religious worker green card, you have to have worked for the religious organization for two years prior to applying for the visa. So note the difference. The non-immigrant R1 visa, you only had to have been a member of the religious organization for two years. To get the green card, you have to have worked for the religious organization, the church or whatever else, for at least two years in, in a similar position. It doesn't have to be the same position because obviously the, if you're going from one country to another, things are called different things, but it has to be a similar position. Um, and you have to show, and I'm sorry, I should have said this for the non-immigrant visa as well. You have to show that you're qualified for the position. So for example, if you're going to be a minister, what they usually want to know is what, what are ministers required to have in this denomination, degree, ordination, certificate, whatever it is, letter from a bishop. It's going to be different, but you have to show that you have it. Or if you're going to be a teacher, you have to show that you have a, if you're going to be a religious teacher, you have to show you have a teaching license. If you're going to be a counselor, you have to show that you're qualified to be a counselor, you know, whether that's a license or whatever else. Um, so the religious worker green card, the biggest difference is the, um, the two years has to be two years of paid work in the position. I'll just also say, though, that typically, and this isn't like an official part of the law, they usually scrutinize green cards more carefully. So, so we've, there, there could be situations where maybe you qualified for an R1. If you tried to go to the green card, they might want more documents. They're, they really want to make sure that everything is, is in order. Um, here's the difficulty with the, the ministerial green card. And this is a difficulty that's only come up in the past year. And it's not just in the religious worker category. It's in a number of employment-based green card categories. Uh, there, uh, starting about a year ago, there are enormous backlogs in the most of the categories to get employment-based green cards. Every green card case has two parts. One is called the petition. That's actually submitted by the potential employer, so that whether it would be the church or the religious school or the counseling organization would submit the petition. You can submit the petition at any time. There's never a backlog to submit the petition. But the minute that you that you submit the, the minute that, that you submit the petition, you get a priority date. Now, if that petition is approved, the priority date is your place in line. If there's no backlog, you can immediately apply for your green card. But in almost every employment-based category including the religious worker category, 
there's right now a significant backlog before you could apply for the immigrant visa to, to come to the United States to get your green card. Um, we don't know right now. Um, I just printed up the visa bulletin from November and the religious worker category. If you're applying overseas, so if you're, if you're coming from overseas, they're currently processing people whose priority dates uh, were March of 2019. So that's four years ago. Um, there is a particular, uh, uh, there was a particular legal change in this category that happened about a year ago, which is part of why this particular category has a backlog. There's potential legislation that might cure or shorten the backlog, but I, we can't really count on that right now because the U.S. Congress is fairly dysfunctional and uh, not passing a lot of legislation, but, but we're keeping our eyes on it. We're watching it carefully because if this legislation passed, it would shorten potentially that religious worker backlog significantly. Let me say uh, one other thing about the green card categories. I said for the for the non-immigrant religious worker visa, the R1 visa, the one that's only good up to five years, um, you could either be a minister or you could be some other kind of religious worker. There's this really quirky aspect of the green card category I'm going to explain this, and if it seems overly complicated or you have questions, please ask. There's one category that's just for ministers. There's also a green card available for non-minister religious workers. But every once in a while, that category disappears because of some really strange legislation. And then every once in a while, that category reappears. If you have a priority date in that category when it exists, and right now there is, that category exists, but it's still subject to the same very long backlog as the ministerial green card. Um, it does exist, but it can go away. So we're, you just have to be really careful um, and be aware of those challenges. Now, religious worker in the United States, to say you were here, maybe you're on the R1 religious worker visa, you can apply uh, in other employment-based categories. You don't have to use the religious worker categories. Those categories all also have backlogs, but many of them are not as long of backlogs. And so um, one is the, the labor certification, the PERM category, and the other is the EB2, potentially the EB2 NIW category. Um, the PERM category, the, the, the difficulty with that is it's going to cost the potential employer a substantial amount of money and take a substantial amount of time to go through that process. The EB2 NIW uh, category, potentially a religious worker could qualify for that. We have, uh, I'd, um, I've worked with like uh, not exactly religious workers, but like youth workers who qualified in that category. Um, but it's it's for a higher achieving person. So you probably need to have had some some real experience and some real achievement in, in your religious career before you could apply in the non-religious worker category, especially that higher EB2 one. That's quite complicated. If you have specific questions, I'm happy to answer those. Um, I also want to note that the R1 non-immigrant visa uh, is is uh, qualifies for what's called dual intent. What that means is that there's certain categories, for example, like a, a, a visitor visa, like a, a tourist visa. If you come to the United States on a tourist visa, you have to show that you don't have immigrant intent, that you're not intending to stay here permanently. And if uh, the U.S. government suspects that you're going to try to stay here permanently, uh, they might deny the application altogether. Um, the R1 visa, the one that you can have for up to five years, you're allowed to have dual intent. So if you were to qualify for an R1 visa and you were to go to your um, interview to get your visa and the person were to say, are, do you, are you going to try to get a green card? And you might, you could say, and for, for that one, I, I, I would like to stay in the United States. I don't know if I'll qualify, but once I'm there, I may try to, to get a, a green card. If you're going for an R1 visa, you're allowed to do that. You're not, it's not where, where you have to show that you're going to return. Um, you're allowed to have the intent to come to work and then maybe you hope to stay. You don't have to prove that you that you don't want to. So, um, so just to quickly review, two religious worker visas. One is a temporary work visa up to five years. One is a green card. The green card is heavily backlogged, uh, but it's a can still be you know you get your place in line as soon as possible if you want to apply for it. 
if you're going to be waiting for a bit. The non-religious, uh, there's no limit on the, the temporary worker visa. The requirements for the temporary visa is that you've been a member of the religious organization for two years. You have a job offer at a legitimate U.S. religious organization doing religious work for which you're qualified. The green card requires that you've worked in that religious organization or, or in maybe, you know, the, the version of that religious organization in your home country for at least two years. The, um, the non-immigrant visa, the, the temporary work visa uh, requires only that you have been a member of that religious organization for at least two years. So I think that that lays out um, the basics of those two religious worker visas. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions or uh, if any of that was unclear, I, I probably went pretty quickly and it's complex stuff. Please feel free to just tell me what you didn't understand and, and I'll do my best to uh, explain. Thank you, Jeffrey. I do have a quick question. Um, so when you were talking about the minister and non-minister positions for the religious worker, could you expand yeah. on what a non-minister position would entail? Sure. And and let me just, there's, there's sort of three categories here. Just like one is the minister, okay, mm -hmm. pastor, whatever. One is the religious worker at a religious institution who's not a minister. At a church, this could be something like a youth worker yeah. or the leader of music. Um, there would be some some positions where it might be hazy, it might be mixed. Uh, we were talking the other day about whether someone who keeps the books for the church, like a financial operator, would count as a religious worker. And we said, you know, if if they only keep the books for the church, it might be hard to call that a religious position. But if they keep the books and raise some money, or if they help determine maybe how charity money is going to be given away, you might make the case that that's a religious position, even though it's not ministerial. Um, in a non-church or a not, you know, like a like a school, like say of a religious school, probably the math teacher is not a religious worker. The religion teacher probably is a religious worker. And again, they're like so I, I gave the example earlier, there, there's we, we we were fortunate uh, like if you teach biblical languages like Greek or Hebrew, we've had those count as religious worker positions. But if you taught Spanish, probably it wouldn't, unless maybe you were teaching Spanish in order so that kids could go on a missions trip. We could try to make the case, you know, you're going to go to Mexico to do something because you were learning Spanish or something. Um, but that would be that would be trickier. We would need to know the specific situation and be able to show the genuine religious aspects of that position. Thank you. And for those on the line, um, the chat is open or else too, if you could just uh, raise up your hand or, um, you know, just ask a question. Any, any questions that you have for Jeffrey, uh, please ask now. Hello, good evening, Jeffrey. Hello. Good evening, I'm from Nigeria. I'm Jumoke from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So I thought the meeting would start by 6 p.m. But they just told me the time changed by one hour. That's why I'm joining very late. I'm so sorry about that. So please, I've not gotten anything you have said, sir. That's okay. Go ahead and ask your question. I'll do my best to answer it. What do you say, sir? Did you, have, did you have a specific question? Okay, it's about this uh, religious um, work I'm asked to join, the how to go about religious uh, workers' green card. So mm -hmm. I'm just joining now. I've not heard anything you've said before okay. now. Okay. How about, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to, I'm going to do like a really fast recap of everything I just said. Does that sound good? I think a few people looks like they came yes, late. Thank you, I'm going to do the three minute version. So thank forgive you. me, but let me, let me ask this other question first. 
and then I'm going to give like the five minute version about religious worker green cards. I see in the chat, somebody asked if a church administrative staff qualifies. I think that's a really good question. So when I ran a church, I ran a, a, a reason. A, well, by African standards, it was not a large church because in Africa, I understand the churches are generally very large, but by American standards, it was fairly large. And we had people who were admit we called them administrative pastors where what they did was very administrative but certainly had a religious aspect to it they decided how the money got spent if we were going to give money that was charity money away they were helping decide how that was going to happen if we were bringing in volunteers they were the ones doing the screening they were interviewing the volunteers they were making religious kinds of decisions but we also had some employees, for example, we had one employee who only did the books, the money, the finances, nothing else, just like it would, she could have the same job anywhere else, just doing the finances, like probably the person who was like the administrative pastor or it could be administrative staff who has clearly religious aspects of their job would count as a religious worker, somebody who is doing only the bookkeeping or maybe only cleaning, like a janitor was just cleaning, nothing else. That would be very hard to call a religious uh, position because it would be hard to prove, well, wh what, what about that is really religious? You could do that anywhere else. You could do that at a restaurant or you could do that at a hotel. There's, there's nothing religious about it. So I think the church administrative staff is going to be a case by case decision. It's going to depend on what their particular job is. Uh, does that answer the question? To, I, I see HOD Evangelism Conference. I think that's who asked that. Does that answer your question? Well, I'll, I'll assume it does, and you can ask a follow-up if you want. Let me go back through uh, the religious worker green card uh, categories. Uh, the requirements for a religious worker, we'll talk about the green card. That is permanent residence in the United States. You must have worked for a, the same religious organization. Let me start from the beginning. Start again. You have to have a job offer from a, a, a U.S. religious organization, church or some other kind of religious organization, <laughs> to work in a religious position in the United States. You must have worked in the same religious organization or its equivalent in your home country, you, however that works, um, for at least two years prior to applying for the U.S. Green Card. Or if you're in the U.S. legally working for that religious organization, if you're in the U.S. legally working for them, you have to work for them for two years. So I shouldn't say, it doesn't have to have been in your home country. It could be in the U.S. as long as it was two years of legal work. Um, the Green Card category, there's separate categories for the Green Card for the minister and for the non-minister. The non-minister category comes and goes. Sometimes it exists and sometimes it doesn't. Um, the minister category is permanent, but there's an extreme backlog, several year backlog for green cards in the minister category. That's why I've talked about the temporary religious worker visa, which is very similar to the green card, but it's only for up to five years. Usually you get two and a half years, then you have to renew it for another two and a half years. The requirements for the religious worker visa, the temporary worker visa, or that you've been a that you have a job offer at a U.S. religious institution. It could be ministerial or non-ministerial. You could be a minister or non-minister religious worker at a legitimate U.S. religious institution, at least part time, at least twenty hours a week, and you've been a member of that religious organization, not having worked in it for two years, just having been a member for at least two years before you apply for the visa. The biggest downsides of the R1, the temporary worker visa again, are that it, it's only for up to five years uh, and you're only authorized to work at that religious organization and your spouse and your children are not authorized to work. Um, one strategy that people have often used is to come to the United States on the R1 temporary worker visa. And then once they're here and they've gotten to the two years of working in a religious organization, they apply for the green card. It's a really good strategy. The only potential downside to that strategy right now is that we don't know how long these backlogs are going to be. And you could run into trouble of not being able to get the green card before you've run out of your five years of, of time. But there's strategies that we can use to try to fix that. We're dealing right now with a, um, a pastor in Texas who ran out of his five years of R1 time. He has an approval 
for the religious work for the religious worker green card, but he's stuck in the backlog. And so we're having to do different things to keep him in legal status until his place in line comes up and he can get the green card. That's been happening to a lot of people. That's why it's the only reason I've just said, really wanted to emphasize that there is this temporary worker green card uh, because of the long backlog for the religious, I'm sorry, temporary worker visa because there's such a long backlog for the green card for the permanent residents. I know that was fast, uh, but if, um, again, you know, ask a follow-up question, I'm happy to, to continue to explain things as clearly as I can. Uh, Jeffrey, I've got another question. I just want to make sure that everybody was on the same page as far as you've had to work for an organization for, you know, the two years. Yeah. This is, you have to be a paid staff and you have to be able yeah. to produce, Thank you. Uh, you know, payment stubs or all of that. Correct. Yes, it has to be paid at a religious institution. And if it's in the U.S., it has to have been in legal status. So, you know, if you've been maybe in the U.S., but been being paid not in a legal status, that's not going to count. They're going to. Um, and they will probably ask for evidence of having been paid if you're if you're coming from overseas. I see a question here. I'm going to read it. Hello, Jeff. I'm a pastor, a minister and handle administrative duties. Good work. It's a lot to pastor and do the administrative work. Both are full-time jobs and you're doing both. I'm very impressed. Uh, I'm a qualified accountant amongst others. Am I qualified? Well, the answer to that question is really what's the job offer that you're looking for in the United States? You know, you, you can't get a religious visa to be an accountant like at a secular organization. Now, if you're going to work as an accountant in a religious organization, it, it would be 50-50. It would depend on the nature of the job. Um, so certainly, uh, for if, if you're coming to work, you know, in a religious institution, now it, that, the question would be, if you've worked, if, if you've been a volunteer, the other question I would ask you, and I'm so sorry that I'm not very good at pronouncing these names, Ayuteo, um, would be as if you've been a paid pastor. I know there's a lot of amazing pastors in the world who work as volunteers. Unfortunately, that won't count for the two years of employment. Um, and I, you know, so if you've been working a secular job while volunteering at a church, that's not going to count as two years of employment. It has to have been two years of paid employment in the religious organization. Um, feel free to ask a follow up if I didn't answer your question very well. Um, okay. Yeah, you're not paid as a pastor, though. Yeah. So now if you. If you've been, um, I'm going to continue to answer his question because I want to keep distinguishing about this this temporary. We say temporary, but it's five years is a long time. Uh, this temporary religious worker uh, visa, if there's a, a church that wants to pay you in the United States, and you've been a member of that church working as a pastor for for a while, you could come on that temporary minister visa and then apply for the green card. Probably once you're here would be a good idea. Uh, but you'd have to get your two years of, of work. Um, so that's my answer to, to that. So, yeah, I'm sorry. This, 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 the, 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 the biggest bummer about these visas, I, you know, I, when I worked as a pastor, I would watch people who were volunteers, both full-time pastors at other churches and even wonderful people who volunteered in our church. Uh, but if, if you're not on the payroll, it, doesn't, it just doesn't count. So I'm sorry about that. All right. I'm going to answer Cammie's here. Please get some clarity. When you say the same religious organization, what does that mean? This is, this is going to be a good question. If I'm a music coordinator at a Methodist church here in Africa, this, do I need an offer from Methodist church over there? I think probably not. Um, if, you've been, if you've been a paid music coordinator, um, we're going to have to show some connections. So at the very least, you know, that, it, that it's a Christian church. Um, if it's a Protestant church, you know, so if you went from a Methodist to a Baptist church, you'd probably be fine. Uh, if you were going from a Catholic to a Protestant, it might be a little more difficult, though um, I've made some creative arguments, so I think that we might be able to make that work. It doesn't have to be exactly the same denomination, though, typically. Um, so that's that's the best answer I have for that. Um, and again, I, I, I can't... You, the problem with every lawyer is we eventually we say, well, it depends on the specific situation. And I know that's a really frustrating answer. But again, you know, um, I believe that you, Samson's going to, I think, collect people who want to follow up with our firm, we'd be happy to look at your resume. The key would be the job offer, though. You know, 
if you send us the resume, that on its own is probably not enough. We need to see what your job offer is um, and, and look to see if, if they're enough of a match. Uh, Dami, for those of us just joining, uh, pull the meeting back. Is there a way we can get a recap of this in our mailbox or the recording? Is there a website for fo follow-up details? Well, certainly, I mean, our web firm, web, uh, our, our law firm's website has our contact information. So you're welcome to do that. I don't know. Is this being recorded? Yes, it is being recorded. So oh. if you sent an email um, to us, we would be glad to send you a recap. And uh, just a quick uh, uh, recap again for the meeting chat. In the meeting chat, I have provided um, different ways that you can reach out to us, whether on the website, uh, www.transnationalcareer.com. You can send us an email, contact at transnationalcareer.com, or our telephone number is uh, also listed. So um, if you want to send us an email um, on the subject line, just say religious uh, visa, um, uh, webinar recap, uh, we'll be happy to send that to you. Um, please provide the email here. Here's mine and the details here so we can copy. Okay, I will provide the, the email again. Um, so that's no problem. Do we have any additional questions online? And for those who want uh, the recording sent to uh, their email, please, uh, the best way is just to email us. If you email us, we can do a mass email sent out so that we're not um, sending it out to one person at the time. So um, on the subject line, again, just, you know, religious uh, visa webinar recap, and we'll be happy to send you a recap of what we talked about today. Well, maybe I... I'm happy to, I'll stick around for a while. So if people have other questions, I'm happy. But I just want to emphasize one one piece of this just to keep people from sort of, I, I don't want to waste your time. You need to have a job offer from a religious organization in the United States. There are some visa categories where you can apply yourself. You know, you don't need a job offer. Those are the, the really high level um, employment-based categories. You have to have a job offer. So, so if if you're, you know, kind of inquiring or whatever, the biggest question, you know, we'd probably ask initially is just who, who's offered you a job in the United States? What's the nature of that job? And then figure out whether you're qualified for it. Um, I do have another question, Jeffrey. So um, I've, is there um, organizations or denominations that, are, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, that can uh, get better processing um, from the government? So is there, you know, Baptist or Catholic or anything like that? Or is it just mm -hmm. a case by case uh, basis? You know, as far as the is the employer on the US side, you know, um, probably, I would say that um, just frankly, you know, the larger the organization is, you know, the more people, the more you know, the more congregations, the the more w whatever, the more schools, the more treatment centers, whatever it is, the bigger it is, the more, the easier it is. Um, I don't think that the government's going to discriminate in terms of what religion it is. Um, now, I, I say that, I mean, if somebody said I've, I've started the first church of getting really high on drugs and our religion is we get really high on drugs. Well, the government is probably, not, I mean, I'm using an extreme example, but there are sometimes fringe groups that are just, the government's going to be like, I've never, I've never heard of that religion. I don't know what that is, but if it's a legitimate religion and there are some specific uh, legal definitions of what constitutes a religious group. Um, but we've worked with some pretty small groups. Um, you know, uh, the, the more documentation, the better. Uh, if you're if you've kept good financial books, make sure you're registered with the IRS. Um, but yeah, I'd be lying if I didn't say that bigger is easier. I don't want to say bigger is better. You know, like when we do work with the Catholics, it's like you know everybody yeah. is like the biggest religious group in the world. Yeah. Um, but it's not a I don't know. It's not a huge issue as long as it's documented. You know, you can't just make it up yourself. It's got to be. 
it's got to have some history and some documents to it. Thank you. Uh, for those who are online, if you have any additional questions, please uh, either unmute yourself and ask the questions or uh, put it in the chat and we'll get to you. Anything else? No stupid questions. <laughs> even if uh, even if something I said seemed like it should be obvious, I go into my boss's office all the time and say, "I'm sorry, this question seems so obvious." <laughs> it's immigration law is complicated, so and you don't want to waste your time and money. No, thank you for this. This is another aspect of you know immigration visa and green card that I don't think most people know or tap yep. into. It's um, true. So it's great, especially the fact I, I'm just going to briefly just the fact that you it doesn't have to be a church and it doesn't have to be a pastor. Um, I think particular things like counselors and youth workers. Uh, there's I think a pretty big demand in the United States for people who want to work with kids, especially kids from immigrant backgrounds who are maybe. It's, life can be a little tough and they need some help. And if there was a religious organization working for them, I mean, that'd be the kind of position that would qualify for this. So. Okay. Um, anything else? I think that's it as far as online. And I don't see anything in the chat um, okay. any longer. Oh, thank you, Jeffrey, so much uh, for today again. Um, and also, uh, if uh, people online, if you want to get in contact with us, I've shared uh, our website, contact, and telephone number um, a couple of times. If you look on the meeting chat history, um, it's there. So uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day um, to uh, be on this webinar with us. I do apologize for the time change. Um, yeah, there is uh, something in the United States that's called daylight savings time. And so depending on when it is in the fall, you fall back one hour. So that screws up everything in the spring, you spring forward one hour, which screws up the time between, you know, here and Africa and other places. So thank we you. Think for we can even control the time in the United States. Yes. <laughs> We try everything. Yeah. <laughs> so we apologize for that again, but thank you so much for um, taking your time out this afternoon and evening. So good evening for everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Jeffrey, uh, for this time. So if there's no additional questions, comments, or concerns, uh, we're going to end uh, the um, the chat. Jeffrey, is there a way to reach out to you? So I let me just put it in the chat, just in case anybody to reach out. There we go. Here's my email, and I'll give our firm uh, phone number to. I guess I'm gonna do a plus one on there. Huh? There you go. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me directly if you want, and uh, I'd be happy to follow up. Two two four four. That should be great. Thanks so much. Nice to meet you, Doris. Good to see you, All Samson. Right. Everybody have a great day. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.